In the mid-1980s, Emaz began developing a fundamentally new tractor truck with the symbolic name Perestroika. This super truck was ahead of its time, impressed with its engineering solutions, and made the automotive press applaud. But unfortunately, it never entered mass production. What made this Soviet marvel so memorable? And why did it remain only a prototype? Before we begin the video, a quick announcement. I use AI-generated voiceovers because I don't yet speak English fluently. However, everything else, the video ideas, the script, the research, and the editing is done entirely by me. Please subscribe to the channel, leave a like and a comment. It's easy for you, but it really helps the channel grow. It is important to note that the engineering and design thinking at MA's, Minsk Automobile Plant, from the very beginning of the plant's existence, was often decades ahead of the production capabilities not only of the plant itself, but of the entire corporation known as the Ministry of the Automotive Industry of the USSR. The designers and engineers could come up with brilliant concepts and sketch them out, but neither MAZ nor its associated Soviet suppliers had the ability to manufacture the necessary components to bring these ideas to life. On top of that, the planned economy demanded simpler, more utilitarian trucks, but in greater numbers. Meanwhile, MAZ's designers kept dreaming, realizing that such advanced concepts were unlikely to ever be mass produced. They would transform their ideas into beautiful sketches and scale models. There were hundreds of these drawings created at the plant, but only a few have survived in photographs, and apparently none in their original form. The dreamers at Emaz were not only focused on aesthetics. For example, in the late 1970s, they started to think about how to increase cargo capacity while maintaining a standard vehicle length. The only meaningful reserve for achieving this goal seemed to lie in reducing the gap between the rear wall of the tractor cab and the front wall of the semi-trailer. In 1978, a young engineer named Viktor Suvolobov tried to take advantage of this idea by building a scale model in which the cab was mounted directly onto the trailer. The trailer itself, in turn, was connected via a fifth wheel coupling to a two-axle fully steerable chassis underneath, similar to the chassis of a conventional tractor unit, but without the cab. One might wonder, had Viktor Sivolobov seen the American sketch from the late 1940s? Most likely no. But right after World War II, the futurist designers of the Detroit-based Bone Aluminum and Brass Corporation, a major aluminum manufacturer, envisioned a very similar vehicle concept for a future tank truck 1960. Just like in Sivolobov's model, its chassis rotated independently of the cab. This is a vivid example of how similar ideas can appear in different parts of the world, sometimes decades apart and entirely independently of one another. These dreams might have remained only dreams, but a few years after Sivolobov's model was created, the stars aligned, both for him personally and for Maz as a whole. In the mid-1980s, with the beginning of Gorbachev's perestroika, the Soviet industry, and including the automotive sector, was encouraged to propose bold ideas and implement innovative projects. As part of this movement, Many enterprises began establishing what were called Youth Scientific and Technical Creativity Centers. MAZ created one as well. That very same Viktor Nikolaevich Sivolobov was appointed to lead the center. He was given a workspace and allowed to assemble a team of five like-minded individuals. What we would today call work on an innovative project of the future officially began in 1986. In one photo next to Sivolobov's model, you can see Mikhail Stepanovich Vysotsky, who was the plant's chief designer at the time. While he was not the direct author of the future project, he advised the young team and, to use modern terminology, served as the executive producer of Maz's Perestroika, and a very effective one at that. It was Vysotsky who, at the end of May 1986, went to Moscow with the team's first results to present them at a major conference reviewing the work of youth innovation centers. 
and Mikhail Stepanovich certainly knew how to pitch an idea to high-level officials. At first, Vysotsky brought the sketches to Moscow. There were many of them. This is just one example. At the time, the concept of biodesign was only beginning to emerge. Yet Maz's artists were already working in this futuristic style. Mikhail Stepanovich succeeded in capturing the attention and support of the Moscow industry leadership. As a result, by the end of 1987, the small team of enthusiasts was expanded into a full-fledged department of around 20 specialists who focused solely on the modular vehicle project. In the winter of 1987 to 1988, the MAZ-2000 project reached the stage of a full-scale mock-up. It was not yet a functioning prototype, but it provided a complete idea of the vehicle's appearance. This mock-up became the first creation of what was by then known as the Innovation Team. By this point, the group was no longer led by Siva Lobov, but by Gennady Sinigovsky, who would later go on to lead MAZ's bus development program. In May 1988, the first operational prototype was completed. This exact vehicle was sent to a closed government presentation in Moscow and also displayed in a private pavilion at the Auto Design 88 exhibition, closed to the general public. By late summer 1988, a second modified prototype was ready, this time meant to impress an international audience. The concept truck was sent to the Paris Motor Show. By then, all wheels were fitted with aerodynamic fairings. It was this second prototype that received the name Perestroika. The term was widely known across the world and was perfectly suited for such a forward-looking concept vehicle. The MAZ-2000 traveled a significant portion of the journey to France under its own power, from Minsk to the port of Riga for loading, and later from the port of Antwerp to Paris. To say the truck made a splash would be an understatement. Maz engineers gave dozens of interviews to European automotive magazines. At the time, there was strong interest in anything Soviet, and even more so in a concept no one else had dared to attempt. The sensation of the Paris International Auto Show was the Perestroika truck. The road train of the 21st century, that's what they called the Minsk tractor in Paris. The French can't believe that MAS Perestroika is a Soviet vehicle. These were the headlines in the European press. The Belgian magazine Transparama wrote, engineers from many companies studied the Perestroika closely and their dismissive smirks quickly turned into looks of amazement. Why do the Russians have a prototype like this? And we don't. Now it's time to talk about the design. Contrary to popular belief, the main concept was not the flat floor cab. It was the modularity of the vehicle family. Different configurations could be assembled using interchangeable structural components. Since this kind of modularity is hard to visualize without illustrations, let's explore it in more detail. The schematic labeled the following modules. One, cab two, power module, consisting of the powertrain, single drive wheels, independent suspension, and lower frame three, steering and coupling module with pivot joint, turning mechanism, coupling device, and fuel tank all integrated in a connecting frame. When combined, these three formed a single axle tractor unit, four, five, cargo module, consisting of a body with a supporting frame, the body could be interchangeable, six, support axle with single wheels and suspension, optionally steerable seven, subframe for axle attachment. Modules six and seven together formed a transport module, when all modules were combined, nine, they created a multi-axle chassis. The perestroika could be configured in various ways. It could serve as a single semi-trailer tractor that offered greater capacity than a traditional truck of the same length. It could also be configured into two-part road trains of different payload capacities. Even three-section configurations were envisioned. The engine, gearbox, final drive, control systems, braking systems, and pneumatic independent suspension units were all integrated into a single module 
measuring 3 by 2.5 meters. One particularly unusual component was the gearbox, designed by MAZ engineers. It was mounted directly behind the engine and merged into a single unit with a hypoid final drive featuring an 82 millimeter offset. Gear shifting was performed via an electro-pneumatic mechanism. Since Maz had never produced or designed engines, the second prototype used a foreign power unit, a horizontally mounted MAND 2866 engine, producing 290 horsepower. The single axle tractor unit composed of the power module, cab, and a frame with a coupling device could independently couple and decouple from a semi-trailer. It was equipped with an automatically extendable support leg with a small wheel at the front, resembling the front landing gear of an aircraft. The transport modules could also roll out from under the trailer, which would remain supported on four retractable, swivel-mounted legs. The cab was unusual as well. A flat floor across the entire cabin, interior height allowing a person to stand upright, a retractable and transformable table, a refrigerator cabinets, a spacious overhead storage shelf running along the top edge of the windshield, and folding seats borrowed from a Scania 142 that had ended up at MAZ after an accident. The door was a sliding type with a pneumatic drive, similar to a bus door. The upper bunk was massive, 800 millimeters wide, with 900 millimeters of clearance between it and the lower fold-out bed all within a cabin just 1,780 millimeters long. The cab structure was a frame panel type, so it didn't require expensive stamping production. Flat floor. That feature gave rise to the myth that Renault representatives, having studied the Perestroika truck at the Paris Motor Show, either copied the idea or purchased a license, which supposedly resulted in the Renault Magnum. These are nothing more than baseless rumors. The French prototype Renault VU-10 Virages, featuring a flat floor cab interior, had already been unveiled back in 1985, three years before the MA's 2000 prototype appeared. It was Virages that served as the basis for the Magnum, not Maz 2000. In Perestroika, the flat floor was not the main idea, the key concept was modularity. The story of Perestroika followed the classic development pattern of concept vehicles. The first prototype presented at the Auto Design 88 exhibition was built to understand how not to do it. The engine turned out to be underpowered, and the bearing, sourced from a radar system, proved unsuitable. That prototype was later disassembled and became a donor for parts used in the third prototype. The second prototype, the most famous one, the Paris model, was built to understand how it should be done. Once lessons were learned, it was significantly modified. The headlights were relocated to the cab body due to legal regulations of the time, which stipulated that the headlight beam must not deviate from the vehicle's axis. That's why the headlights were moved from the engine module to the cab. Air intake slots were added to the front of the engine module to improve cooling. The third vehicle, built in 1989, also initially had three axles and reused some components from the first prototype. However, most of those parts, including the power modules and axles, were fully replaced, and the third prototype became a four-axle truck. The rear axles were now mounted rigidly to the frame instead of on modules which for the purpose of verifying the overall concept, wasn't critically important at that stage. Additionally, both the second and third prototypes were tested with a trailer module equipped with its own power unit. This powered trailer was connected to both the modified second prototype and the third truck. The prototypes were also repainted several times, which added to the confusion and ongoing debate over how many perestroikas existed. The correct answer, one full-scale non-functional mock-up and three different running prototypes were built, but never did three operational examples exist simultaneously. As a new decade began, Maz registered international patents for the perestroika concept. The first U.S. patent for a tractor trailer was granted in June 1991, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. The second, 
for an articulated truck vehicle was granted in August 1992, after the USSR had dissolved. The fate of the prototypes varied. The first, the Moscow prototype, was dismantled and used as a parts donor. The second prototype, the famous Paris one, though significantly altered, slowly aged and became overgrown with asphalt, sitting unused at the factory until at least 2006. Though it was theoretically restorable, it was ultimately scrapped in the unfortunate tradition of many Soviet automotive plants. The third, four-axle prototype was the luckiest. It was kept in working condition for many years, took part in the MAZ 50th anniversary parade in 1994, and even participated in a retro vehicle festival in Minsk in 2002. Afterwards, it sat for eight years on factory grounds. Eventually, in 2010, the truck was placed on a pedestal in front of the MAZ headquarters building on the initiative of plant director Borovsky. Today, that vehicle stands as a monument. Surprisingly, the MAZ Perestroika wasn't the only vehicle of its kind. The Fagiol 1950 TC cargo liner, developed by the Fagiol Motors Company, was presented as part of a U.S. Army tender for 1,650 trucks. In addition to its unusual stainless steel body, the Fagiol featured several other unconventional solutions. The engine was placed underneath the floor, and dual wheels were mounted on the front axle. But the most unique aspect was that the entire front axle could pivot, unlike standard trucks. Unfortunately, the project didn't gain approval from the military, and the only prototype ever built was most likely scrapped. Fortunately, some photographs have survived, allowing us to see what this unique truck looked like. It's also worth mentioning the Kenworth Wind Clipper, a conceptual sketch published in Popular Mechanics in the mid-1880s. Sadly, that design never progressed beyond the drawing board. All in all, the MAZ Perestroika was a bold and truly fascinating project that was ahead of its time. It proved that even within a planned economy, it was possible to dream, to experiment, and to impress the entire world. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel leave a like, and write a comment. That's the best way to support the author. And if you'd like to go further and help the channel grow, the sponsorship button is always available below the video. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.